Dusty, have you ever gone on a hunting trip? Well, yeah. You pack all your stuff. Let's say you're driving to New Hampshire. Let's say I'm driving to Ohio, and you're hunting for four, five, six days. What's the biggest challenge you usually have? You're going to stop multiple times and get gas, and I, I worry about odor the whole way. It's always in the back of your head. After talking to our friend Tim Gothier, we realized that there's a better solution that is portable. And that solution is called the Scentlock Enforcer. This nifty little device about the size of an iPhone, it produces ozone. Ozone is this naturally occurring O3 molecule that actually naturally removes odors, kills bacteria, binds to all kinds of odor particles in the air, and basically makes you scent-free instead of like a scent cover-up. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. You can put this in your toe. It operates off of a USB and has an eight-hour battery life. It's the personal ozone generator. It is the personal ozone generator. If you want to check it out, go to scentlockenforcer.com. That's S-C-E-N-T-L-O-K Enforcer. Com. Big Buck Registries Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Scentlock Enforcer, episode number 173. Tim Brent. Hockey gave me a lot, but nothing replicates hunting. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Scentlock Enforcer, the Euro Hanger, and Morse's Sporting Goods. <laughs> Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Bob Dumong from the Buckhorn Boat Dog, listening to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey everyone, it's Eva Shockey. You're about to listen to another great episode of Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Sam Ubel from Whitetail Adrenaline, and I'm pressing play on one of my favorite podcasts, Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. My name is Jay, and as I talk into this microphone right now, I know you're listening on your audio device, whether it's your iPhone, your phone, or some, some other variety. Maybe you're listening to us uh, in your car. Maybe you tapped into your computer, and maybe you looked at it's on a set-top box like a Roku unit or Apple TV or something like that. But whatever it is, I want to say thank you for joining us and tuning in this week because we have a really great guest. And when I say we, I mean me and my co-host from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. How are What's you? Happened, Jay? I'm real good. Uh, the Ohio rut's here, and uh, things are heating up in the woods, and it's time where the unknown can happen. The pattern is off, as I like to say. The button has switched, and now they're they're off and roaming. You never know what's going to show up. You don't. It's uh, it's mystery. Mm-hmm. Mystery. That's what I like to call November, because, man, that mystery buck that you have no clue was in the it's, area passes through. It's been, yeah, it's a mystery buck. The Cubs won the World Series. A guy by the name of Trump is now the president-elect. There are millennials running around the streets, fighting for the liberal side of things still. And it's deer hunting season, and we're going into the rut. It's been a crazy week. It has been a crazy week for sure, no doubt about it. (laughs) Uh, Just some of the stuff I would never have written written up exactly as scripted. Just nuts. You can't make this stuff up, in other words. Yeah, SHOT Show's book, the rut's on, Trump got elected. Mm Mm-hmm. Holy cow. Got a lot done this week and some very unusual things. Things that were seemed unlikely at the start have now come together. So, yeah, we'll, SHOT Show, me, you, Jim Keller, we're all registered and ready to go. There's a chance, a slim chance, that Greg's going to join us as well. Oh, no kidding. I dropped this, I planted the seed again yesterday <laughs> after we hunted at his place. My son and I went to Greg's. And as I was parting, I said, you know, there's still room at SHOT Show for one more. And he said, hmm, let me think about that. Which And it was a, that's a different conversation we had last time when you were here for bear season. It was absolutely not. I couldn't do that. Right, right, right. So you dropped the seed on Greg, huh? Yeah. It's always nice to take our business rep with us. 
It is. It's good. Good to have our business manager along with us. As And we were discussing this over our uh, glass of, of bourbon that we sipped after the hunt. Very nice. Yeah, it was quite quite good. So this week's guest, Dusty, is Tim Brent. And I'm sure you've heard of Tim Brent, but in a different breath. Tim has been known for his NHL career, and he's played a lot, quite a few years in the NHL, grew up in Cambridge, Ontario, and ended up moving to Carolina uh, when he was playing for the Carolina Hurricanes. Well, it turns out uh, Tim is also a deer hunter. He learned to deer hunt in Maine. A couple of his NHL captains turned him on to that, actually. And it ends up, turned out that he married Eva Shockey, and now he's part of the Shockey family. So he and Eva live in North Carolina, where they, from what I understand, hunt almost every day. They're expecting, and we get to hear the story about how Tim went through the, his NHL career, learned how to deer hunt, what he's into now, and how he met Eva Shaka. We hear the whole story of how they actually met, and then uh, get to hear a little bit what he's got a, what he's got going on in the future. Now, one of the things that I wanted to read before we turn to the news segment with Jim Keller is, uh, you know, on the last show, Dusty, we had talked about tree stand safety a lot. And right. We had our friend Bob Dumong on who had fallen from a tree stand and we wanted to know what it was like. We had a lot of requests from listeners who wanted to know what it was like to fall out of a tree stand. So we found that my good, it just happens that my good friend Bob fell out of a tree stand a few years ago and he shared that experience with us. And we decided collectively that we have a lot of these spare tree stand harnesses in our garages or in our hunting rooms that come with tree stands. I had three in my garage, and we threw it out there to some people who may not have one, who need one, and we offered to send them whatever we have. And actually, I had somebody take me up on it, which I thought was pretty cool. A guy by the name of Jimmy Marawa, he says, Hey, Jay, I heard of the Tree Stand Safety Podcast today, number 172. I've been using a used climber, and I never did get a safety harness. I tied a rope to the bottom of the platform, For obvious reasons, I have to hunt public land, and I could really take you up on that safety harness if you'd be willing to get me one. Some of the trees I climb seem like suicide trees. I'd appreciate it a lot. I got up to hunt this morning and was was the very first to view and commit on YouTube as Jimmy One Life. Love the show and can't wait until next Saturday for the new podcast, Jim Marawa. And Jim, your tree stand harness from my garage, still in the package, unopened. Well, it was shipped out to you earlier this week, so hopefully you got it. Um, and uh, please let me know. And uh, be safe out there, everybody. So yeah, I have two left. If anybody wants one, all you do is shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com, and we'll ship you out whatever we have. I think you have a couple too, Dusty. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so, uh, Jay. Uh, at least one for sure that I know of. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to send one out to Dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. The Deer News this week is sponsored by the Eurohanger. You don't have to spend big bucks to hang your big buck. Get yourself a Eurohanger. Facebook.com forward slash Eurohanger, E-U-R-O-H-A-N-G-E-R. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. In our first story this week, possible world record deer killed in Sumner County, Tennessee. This story was featured on the Tennessean website. A possible world record white-tailed deer was killed in Sumner County, Tennessee on Monday, but it was days in the making. Stephen Tucker, 26 of Gallatin, attempted to shoot the trophy buck with a muzzleloader on Saturday, but his gun misfired. He saw the animal again later in the day, but was too far away to get what he thought was a clean shot. I was just hoping I would see him again after I passed up the second shot. When I saw him, said Tucker, who estimated he was about 150 yards away at the second sighting, my thinking was the second time I saw him that he was too far away, and as big as he was, I wanted to make sure that I got a clean shot. I didn't want to cripple him. Tucker saw the buck again two days later, about 6 a.m. on Monday, and killed him with a shot from approximately 40 yards away. There's no doubt it's going to be the new state record. I mean, that's an absolute, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency District 21 Captain Dale Grandstaff said. As far as the world record, the rack is about an inch over the world record. Since the rack must undergo a 60-day drying out period before it is officially measured, the score could change slightly, and because it is so close to the world record, it might not stand up. There is 
is no chance, however, that it won't beat the state record. The current state record, a buck killed by Dave Wachtel in Sumner County in 2000, grossed 256 points and netted 244 and 3 8 The world record killed in 2003 by Tony Lestuen in Albia, Iowa, had 38 points and scored 307 and 5 8 net. Grandstaff said the deer was likely three and a half years old. A deer like this doesn't come along very often, Grandstaff said. The field pictures don't really do it justice. You would have to actually see it to understand the amount of non-typical growth it has. Deer harvest up 30% in Minnesota. This article was featured on the Masabi Daily News website and was written by Jesse White. Tower Minnesota area deer registrations are up 30.2% for the first four days of the 2016 season of the whitetail firearm season compared to the same time frame in 2015. Preliminary numbers from the Department of Natural Resources show an increase from 8 48% in eight out of nine permit areas in northeastern Minnesota. Only one permit area, number 117, which is in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness on the northeastern tip of the Arrowhead region, showed a decrease of 53%, but that was from 19 deer last year to 9 deer this year. Across the entire tower work area, hunters have harvested 3,117 compared to 2,395 in 2015. Statewide, it appears the harvest is down so far as hunters have bagged 66,130 deer so far this season compared to 71,389 at this time last year. A number of factors have contributed to hunter success in our area so far this season, including a rebounding deer population and the hunt coinciding with the annual rut. The unseasonably warm temperatures, it was in the 70s on Saturday and Sunday, have also helped, Rush said, as those summer-like temps are keeping hunters in the field and in their stands longer. It's also leading to a quicker registration and butchering of the animals since it's been too warm to leave them hanging. Rush said that hunters are seeing lots of young deer as the herd is recovering from the harsh winters of 2013 and 2014. The 2016 season runs through Sunday, November 20th. Wildland fires, dry conditions create hazards for deer hunters in Kentucky. This story was originally posted by the WMKY 90.3 FM website and was written by Libby Burton. More than 300,000 Kentucky hunters preparing for this weekend's modern gun deer season opener should be aware there are at least 22 wildland fires burning, many in southeast Kentucky as drought conditions persist across the state. About 14,000 acres have burned in the Commonwealth since October 29th. Governor Matt Bevan declared a statewide emergency last week and urged all citizens to refrain from outdoor burning and use extreme caution during outdoor activities. Hunters can help by using camp stoves and lanterns instead of building campfires and by being diligent in extinguishing any cigarettes, said Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources Commissioner Greg Johnson. We also need to be mindful of hot exhaust in our trucks, cars, and ATVs. Hot exhaust easily can start fires given the exceptionally dry conditions that exist now nearly everywhere. Safety is foremost. Hunters should be certain of their target and background. Hunters also can help tremendously by being vigilant. Anyone observing a fire condition should call the poaching hotline at 1-800-25-ALERT or 1-800-252-5378. What a Donald Trump presidency means for hunters and shooters. This story was originally posted on the OutdoorHub.com website. Hunters and gun owners alike woke up Wednesday morning and were able to breathe a sigh of relief when they found out Donald Trump won the presidency. So what does a Donald Trump presidency mean for the hunters? Well, Outdoor Hub recently published a handful of articles that spell out exactly what to watch for. A couple of real big concerns in the election were the handling of the Supreme Court and defending our Second Amendment rights. With Trump behind the wheel, we can rest assured that our right to bear arms is safe and sound. The only thing we do have to watch out for is transferring federal lands to the states. Sure, it sounds reasonable, but in reality, it's just a backdoor attempt at allowing more resource extraction from our public lands. When you break it all down, and it's a lot to digest, it appears, at least for now, that this was a big win for hunters. If you compare Donald's America versus Hillary's America, it can be a little scary for both sides, but at least with Trump, we don't have to worry about someone showing up at our doors looking to take away our deer rifles. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to our stories featured this week, please check out our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas or questions for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. 
Thanks to Jim Keller for the deer news. Without further ado, here's Tim Brent. Tim Brent, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm great. How are you doing? Uh, doing quite well. Quite well. It's uh, The leaves are changing, and, and it's autumn in New Hampshire, and it, the, the weather is cold and crisp, and it gets me excited to get back out in the woods. Yeah, I hear you. I'm down in, in North Carolina now, and it's uh, certainly a different, um, different deer hunting climate down here. I've been sweating quite a bit in tree stands, which... It's something I'm certainly not used to, but I uh, bet, I bet. So, but, so you're you're in North Carolina now, and did you, did you just recently relocate? We did. Um, I played uh, I played professional hockey for 12 years. Originally grew up in um, Cambridge, Ontario, which is about an hour and a half west of Toronto, Ontario, and um, <clears throat> certainly a colder climate there. But uh, we. I actually played for the Carolina Hurricanes here in Raleigh for two years and fell in love with the area. Um, just a, you know, an outdoorsman's dream kind of area, really. It's uh, two hours to the to the coast if you want to do any offshore fishing or uh, inshore fishing, and you're two hours to the mountains where it's just a r- very pretty part of the country. Uh, and everywhere in between is filled with greenery and you know those those woods that we all love to be in so uh, right just a a real enjoyable place to live and and a place that it fits uh fits our lifestyle so gotcha. we're uh, we're excited to be back here very nice have you been an outdoor person or outdoorsman your whole life i have um my dad doesn't really hunt he's uh he uh he just never really got into it but um but I've been fishing since I could literally walk. And, uh, that's a, been a huge part of my life, something that I'm still very obsessed with. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree that most, most hunters fish, but, uh, yes, I got, I got into hunting a little later in my life. I was about not about 19 turning 20 and I, I moved away to, to play my first professional year of hockey. And I had a couple, uh, a couple guys from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, some older guys uh, in our locker room, our veteran, actually one guy was our captain, who were big, big hunters. And um, they're really the ones that got me into it. And it, it started off with uh, with a guy named Aaron Gavey, who he shot a shot a doe one night for, for meat for the winter and kind of ran down into a, a ravine on him. And uh, he called me and, and asked if I could come help him out nice. you know so we uh we dragged the deer out i helped him with with cleaning it and you know a couple couple coors lights to celebrate and sure <laughs> i think i was i was pretty much hooked right there it was, you know i wasn't even uh probably two weeks later i went went and bought myself a bow and shot it and shot it in the driveway found a little a little piece of property that uh i was in maine at the time yeah up near portland and uh, strawberry farmer, I think 20, 25 acres or something. And I, I got permission to hunt his property and set up a stand. And my, my first hunt probably didn't go like the majority of, uh, of people's first hunts, but, uh, I shot a, a little six pointer about 15 minutes sitting in the stand. <laughs> so, so uh, you didn't have a lot of time to sit there and take it in and, and go through the no, tri- trials no. and tribulations of, <laughs> of getting a deer that's worthy of a shot to walk by your stand. You had it done in 15 minutes. That's pretty good. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, talk about the, you know, the, the adrenaline rush, um, every, everything that every hunter understands, uh, you know, your first time taking an animal and especially with a bow, I swear that, that, you know, that deer could hear my heart pounding through my chest and <laughs> something that again, instantly hooked and, you know, now will be a, a hunter for life and something that will, will certainly be passed on to the, to the next generation and in, in our family. It is fascinating, isn't it? Like how your mind kind of overtakes your body and you literally, you can feel your heart pounding and you're like, where is this coming from? Have you ever felt anything like that in your life? There, there's nothing, there's literally nothing you can do um, that, that replicates that. And I, I truly believe that I, um, you, your, your senses, everything about your body that um, you may not be in tuned with it all comes together at that point. And, um, 
like you said, it, it's it's almost an out of body experience because you're 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 doing something that you feel things that you just don't normally feel. And and I've got to play in some, you know, fortunately I've got to play in some pretty big hockey games and be a part of uh, some championship teams and um, just nothing, nothing quite compares to it. It's hard to explain to anybody that doesn't hunt what the feeling is like. And and I'm sure, you know, you have the same trouble at putting, putting into words exactly what you go through when, um, when you're doing that. So, uh, I still, still to this day, love the, uh, love the rush, right. love the, uh, the adrenaline. Um, and now it's, uh, it's very cool to be able to control it to a certain extent. Um, and, and again, the, the more you, the more you hunt and the more you, you put yourself in that position and you feel all those same feelings and you can, you can, somewhat control control those those kind of different feelings so um if you didn't feel that emotion do you think you'd still do it um i think i would i think there's um there's still a lot to be said for you know just so many different aspects of hunting obviously the 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 meat even i both really believe in eating healthy and um as a you know, as a hockey player for, that was my, you know, my career, my job was to, to make sure my body was in the, the best condition it could be to, to perform at its, at its highest. And I truly believe there's no better, there's no better food than, than wild game. And so that would bring me back. The time of disconnect would bring me back just because it, we watch TV, we have emails that come to our phone, text messages, um, you know, kids are playing video games and on the internet. And being able to get back to the very basics and be out in an area where you don't see anybody else and it's completely quiet, that alone would bring me back. So uh, as cool as the adrenaline rush is and 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 that feeling, um, you know, right before you take an animal uh, or right after there, there are just so many other aspects to hunting that I think people can draw from. And, and that, and that's truly, I think what, what brings us back, you know, when you're, when you're not successful is you still, when you're not, when you don't have a successful hunt where you take an animal, it's still an awesome experience. Very much. And that, yeah. So I definitely would, would hunt, um, regardless of that rush. I found over the years that when I was a younger man in my twenties, that I would hunt for the, and the style of hunting I was doing was mostly ground hunting. And Mm -hmm. it was like, I was putting in the physical effort and I needed that, but I also needed that adrenaline rush when I found the deer and, and took the shot. Like that's what I was looking for. These days, it's completely reversed. These days, I get bombarded, you know, sitting in front of the computer, um, getting the kids back and forth to soccer, people calling me, asking me to do different things. My peace and quiet is in the woods. And now I go there for a completely different reason than I used to. And I think it's just the, the as, as life transforms, that's what you do. It, but it's always been a part of my life, and I can't imagine it ever not being a part of my life, but for different reasons today. Yeah. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. And and I think I've evolved as a hunter in, in the way that, uh, I look at it as well. And just, um, when I, when I, when I first started, uh, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to kill an animal every time I went out. Right. You know what I mean? Like that was, and I, and I, and I understand that's the, you know, that's the ultimate goal, but now I'm just as happy to sit and watch, you know, I watched, I don't know, 12 does and three young bucks walk by the other day. It was just, just as rewarding to be out there and, and like you said, just be in the quiet and, yeah. and watch those animals in their, you know, natural habitat and not feel like I needed to, to kill something to, to be successful. And, and then, you know, obviously the other thing is, as you mature as a hunter, you, you begin to realize that you'll never, you know, you'll never shoot a big deer if you keep shooting, you know, three-year-olds. So, yes, um, that is a, a big, <laughs> that's, that's a tough lesson to learn. It is, it is. And, 
in North Carolina, it's, um, you know, the first time I, I lived down here, I, I came from Ontario and our, you know, our deer, the bodies were relatively big and um, I probably let, I don't know, 15, 20 deer walk by before I realized that they're just not getting any bigger. And this is, uh, you know, if you're going to take a deer, it's got to be kind of this size. And, uh, um, but I've been pleasantly surprised this year at uh, what we have on trail cameras. And I've got a couple targeted bucks that um, I'm hoping make a mistake here soon. And during shooting hours, but uh, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Hopefully, you'll see full, them on the hook. full moon. Isn't going to help, but right. um, but we'll see. So, your first deer hunting experience of your own, uh, you helped your buddy uh, drag a deer out of the woods and had it celebrated with a couple of course lights. But then you ended up in Maine for your first hunt. How did you end up in Maine? I, I don't usually so, hear that. You know, it's like <laughs> you, you've you've traveled all over the world, and then, you, and then you end up in Maine for your first deer hunt. How did that happen? I was playing in Portland for the, the Portland pirates gotcha. um, and uh, he, you know, he was away. He had a couple kids and um, his wife were at home and he, you know, he was hunting basically in his backyard. Um, so he, uh, he, he called me and um, said, you know, this, this deer, I just, I just shot a doe and she ran down into this ravine. and It's going to be a nightmare. I don't have anybody to really help help me get her out. So, um, so I drove over and I said, listen, I, you know, I'm not gonna pretend I know what I'm doing, but <laughs> I'll, I'll certainly help you out here. And, uh, but it was, it was just a cool experience. It really was. And, um, he was the type of guy that really, uh, respected wildlife and, uh, and, you know, really took care of the meat when we, when we, uh, dressed it. And, um, and then, you know, uh, after that, I, I got to enjoy, you know, some, some back straps and, uh, sure, sure. you know, I got that whole experience without actually hunting and, um, and just was drawn to it. I think, I think probably it came back to, you know, spending, spending so much time out, you know, my dad and I would walk trails and, um, we'd speckle trout fish like way back in, the middle of nowhere and um and it was the adventure in and out that were it was just as much fun as the actual fishing trip so i could bring that same adventure into um into spending time in the woods and hunting and um i really saw that when i when i helped my friend there with the with the doe so gotcha and that led to your hunt uh on your own uh, taking the six pointer that was that was also in maine Yes, it was. It was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Portland's a great town. Uh, and did you get the, really enjoyed the yeah. time in Portland? Yeah. yeah, there's some amazing uh, farm to table food vibe going on there. Oh, and, and I mean, again, as a as a fisherman, the, the seafood in Portland mm-hmm. is out of this world. Um, so, uh, I really, you know, that, that whole Old Port area was a real cool, um, real cool part of the the country and uh, so much history and I really enjoyed my time there. So you, you spent some time playing hockey, uh, a lot of time playing hockey. You made a career out of playing hockey. How did you get into hockey? Um, I was, like I said, I I was, I grew up in in Cambridge, Ontario, Mm -hmm. um, and specifically a little, a little area called Hespler, uh, Ontario, which, kind of three little towns make up Cambridge now and huge hockey town. Uh, I was, I was skating at, I think 18 months old, um, played my first year of hockey at four. Um, and just really much like hunting fell in love with it, uh, from the very first time I played. And, um, I remember being seven or eight years old and just thinking that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this as a career. And, so you knew kind back then, point. you knew at that age that that was something. Well, right. I just, I just knew, and I've, I've kind of always been, I guess, in that mindset where if you want something bad enough, you're willing to do the, the necessary things to get to it. I mean, I, there were, I was blessed with certain talents and, but there were certainly guys that I grew up playing against or with, or throughout my career that were far far more talented than i was i just knew that i was willing to do whatever it took to 
to get to that goal. And, and there were a lot of, a lot of things I gave up and I don't want to say gave up, but there were a lot of times in high school where i you know, I missed parties and missed times where, sure. you know, the rest of my buddies were, uh, were doing different things where I thought that my end goal of, of playing, you know, at the highest level in, in hockey was, was more important. And I'm, you know, sitting here at 32 now retired from, <laughs> from playing <laughs> hockey. And, um, uh, I, I'm certainly glad I, I did make those very little, you know, small sacrifices at the time. They seemed a lot bigger than they, right. they do now, but, right. um, but I, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I, uh, feel very blessed to have played as long as I did. And just, uh, hockey gave me a lot, a lot. Right. So do you, do you feel, and this, I, I don't, I guess only professional athletes would potentially feel this way unless you really struck it big doing something else. Do you feel weird that you're 32 and retired from your first <laughs> career? Um, not, I, I know it's, it, it probably, probably sounds strange, but not really just because it's, uh, I think I, and I tried to prepare for, for this mm-hmm. and it was important um, unfortunately there's, there's times in hockey where, um, there's, you know, you've played with guys who, who didn't prepare and they were expecting to play next year and just didn't get a deal, yeah. didn't get a contract and, and they're forced out. And, uh, and I think those are, those are a lot harder times to be, um, to be trying to do something else. So it was, it was important for me to prepare, um, for the end of my career and what I wanted to do next. And, um, and it was also important that I left hockey on my own terms. So, right. Uh, I kind of prepared that way. I understood that, you know, I'm getting to the point where, you know, I, I could have probably played a couple more years, but I got a great opportunity to come back and live in Raleigh and, uh, work in commercial real estate, which is something that I have had a, um, a very big interest in since I was about 20, uh, mostly on the investor side, but, um, but something I really, uh, had a passion for and, um, I got to come again back to Raleigh, work for a great company and, uh, and was excited about doing, some, doing something new. Is that the, pup- so, the puppy? That's, that's the dog. Yeah. She's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Literally doesn't say a word until you're on the phone, and then uh, <laughs> yes, they have a keen sense. She, of that. Uh, I don't know how it she, is. She'll either start barking or right. playing with her squeak toy. So, and and just so you know, the kids do the same thing. <laughs> just, we're uh, yeah. as I'm sure you know, we're we're expecting our first in January, right. and we're uh, we're thrilled about it. But we understand that life's going to be a little different then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, that's one of my warnings to you is that they, you think dogs are bad. Kids will wait and won't talk to you until you pick up your phone and then they need everything in the world. Right. Yeah, so right. just prepare yourself for that. And it's just part of life. Well, that's fascinating. So you're, you're on to a career in commercial real estate and which is a, a great profession. Uh, I certainly understand real estate from some of my former careers and it makes uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting career path that's for sure when yeah yeah it is it's uh much like much like hockey it's um you know it's about relationships it's about and, and things the other cool thing is it's it's different every day you know i can right. uh i can truly say that so um i'm really enjoying it and and then on top of that it's uh you know it's given me an opportunity to, to do some some hunts and, and some things that I've wanted to do for a long time that, right. uh, that I just haven't been able to because of, because of my hockey schedule. So, uh, that's another thing I'm excited about. Exactly. So <laughs> hunting in Maine where you'd done some hunting compared to North Carolina, are there other contrasts and differences between where you hunted in Maine and where you're hunting now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, for, for me, I guess with, with, kind of hunting i guess i started in maine and then i basically just hunted wherever i played but the the weather in in north carolina is i mean literally we had a hurricane on on saturday and it sucked all the humidity out of the air and it's been beautiful this week and temperatures have dropped a little bit and it should get get things fired up here but up until then i mean it was you know 
85, 88 degrees. I'm sitting in a tree stand, literally sweating my face paint off, right, right. which is something that I'm just not used to doing and not used to dealing with. I, I mean, I don't even, uh, you know, I don't even really have that much early season gear to, right. to prepare for it. So it's, right. uh, it's been a, it's been a bit of a learning curve as far as that goes. Um, and, and I'm a, I'm a tree stand hunter, um, kind of just by default, I guess. That's the way we hunted in Maine to start. That's the way I hunt. I hunted in Ontario, and um, so I'm very, very much a scent control kind of hunter, especially gotcha. bow hunting. And um, it's been a nightmare trying to deal with all, all the sweat that I'm not used to right. having to deal with. So. I, I can relate to that. I, I, I'm from New Hampshire. I hunted and lived in New Hampshire my whole life. And on occasion, I'll venture out to other states. And my most recent venture was early season Maryland for bow hunting. Mm-hmm. I was not ready for the <laughs> amount of humidity that you experience. Uh, and just walking to the stand, I, I, I started sweating. I'm like, this is not not my normal situation here. And I don't really know how to prepare for it. I can only put on so much no scent deodorant and you can't take a shower every time. And I'm really getting sick of spraying myself every 10 minutes with, 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 with my spray. And so it's, it's a whole other challenge in and of itself. And I don't know how to combat that. Uh, you take a guy from the North and stick him in the South and just, your body's not ready for it. Just not used to that kind of stuff. Uh, I hear you. So your, your techniques are really tree stand hunting. Uh, do you prefer bow or gun? I really, uh, I really prefer bow hunting. Um, it, I, to be honest, I, I, uh, I haven't shot a whole lot of deer with, uh, with a rifle. Um, but uh, I will, I will be doing some rifle hunting this year and, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, but there's something, there's something just special about bow hunting. And, um, I think part of the allure to, for me is, uh, is figuring the deer out enough that you can get close enough to shoot one. And that's, you know, the, the preparation that you do all summer long and, and, um, and leading up to bow opener is, is a lot of the fun in, in bow hunting. And, um, this year we were behind the late, the, the eight ball a little bit with, with moving here to Raleigh. Uh, we got some, uh, some hunting property from some friends that own the property and we just didn't have enough time to, to truly set things up the way we'd want to, but we, we were starting to figure them out a little bit. Uh, you, you know, I, I have a, a climbing stand that I can move around a little and uh, at least right now with, the acorns have fallen off the trees and the, all the deer are where the acorns are at. So I can kind of move, move around a little bit and, uh, and that'll allow me to at least semi figure, figure out the property for, for right. next year. Gotcha. So. Very cool. So as far as the study, I mean, we like to kind of hear what kind of gear you bring into the woods with you. Um, it sounds like you're primarily a bow hunter. What, what types of things do you, you prepare for? What types of tools and, and things go into your backpack, for example, that help you prepare for hunt? So if you could just kind of even, you know, mentally envision your backpack and what, right. what, you, what do you bring in to the woods with you? Well, I guess it, it would depend on, um, on what I was or where I was hunting. If I, I have some lock on stands that, I probably wouldn't bring as much in, you know, I basically take my scent bag out of the back of my truck, pull all my, my clothes out, spray everything down, change in the field and walk in, um, as quiet as possible. Okay. Okay. Um, with, with my bow, my quiver, my release and, uh, and I'm ready to go. Now, if I'm hunting a climber, um, there's, there's a little more, I guess, to uh to bring in um i always have i always have my binos with me um they're loophole they're uh fantastic set of binoculars uh really um really when you're you're hunting especially new areas um i find myself and on them a lot trying to figure these these deer out but uh 
so when I, when I hunt a climber, I, you have to have a rope to, to pull your bow up. Right. Uh, I always bring a, a bow hook just so I can screw something into a tree and have my, my bow handy, but uh, not in my hands necessarily. And range finder to range different. You hunt in a new area, it's important that you can have kind of targets where you know if a deer comes by a certain area, you, you've got markers that you can um you know the range is on and and then just bow and my my quiver and uh, gotcha what it's pretty pretty standard i guess but what do you get into i mean we talked a little bit about scent control what do you use for scent control in the area you're in now well i mean it's it's everything from um you know washing my i'll usually wash a set of towels in the scent in scent soap um and then run my so it kind of runs through the the washing machine once and then i'll put my hunting clothes in to wash the with the scent so after the towels and you know i have the the no scent dryer sheets that i put put in the with the with my hunting gear and and then the field spray that uh just stays in my truck all the time and then i really kind of douse everything down with that and then same as in the shower if you know obviously sometimes you can't you can't do it, but if I'm hunting early or if I get a chance to get out in the morning, I'll I'll shower in, in the no scent stuff, uh, you know, body wash, shampoo, deodorant, um, and I and and I think it comes from certain certain parts where I grew up that you could bow hunt were very urban. Um, you know, you you weren't you weren't too far from town, and there were yeah. small plots of, of acreage, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity to change stands based on wind and and really hunt the wind so you you had to take every kind of preventative measure to just make sure you didn't get blown out by by a doe or something while you're sitting up there and so uh, that that's something and i know certain people you know some people don't believe in it and i'm i'm a believer and that's uh an under armor um has has made now uh, you know a kind of a scent control line that that i really believe in and use and so that's another you know another part of the the deal is is using the i guess the proper clothing to to hold that that no scent spray and stuff right right yeah there's definitely some really good clothing on the market now that i think advance a huge advancement over what we probably had 20 years ago oh yeah i can't even uh, you know just from the way everything fits to the how quiet everything is to, um, you know, obviously the patterns now are incredible. So, right. uh, it, it just goes and, and it's just going to continue to get better. And, and, uh, um, I think you see that in, in everything in the sport and, um, the bows are faster, they're lighter, they're quieter. The guns are lighter. They're, you know, more accurate, less recoil. It's, it's just right. The science behind all the things that we use, whether it be the clothing or the, the firearm or the weapon, always advancing the, exactly. uh, the, the, the technology is advancing and yeah, right down to and some, some of the gimmicks are even good. You know, some of the, I don't know, the spray you, you have, you know, mouthwash now that's specific for deer. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, right. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but yeah, there's a lot of it. Do you have a, a particular style of uh, camouflage that you prefer to wear while you're bow hunting in North Carolina? Um, I'm using a uh, Ridge, Ridge Reaper forest right now. And it's a, uh, it's a new pattern from Under Armour. And I think it's a, uh, um, a really diverse pattern, um, especially for early season. It's uh, break, really breaks things up. It's so green here that the forest pattern really kind of blends in with that greenery, and that's what I've been using. Haven't been busted. Been uh, you know certainly have had some opportunities to to shoot some animals, but just haven't had the right one walk out yet. So it you know it's been it's been good, and, and like I said, it's uh, it's so it's so hot that the, the clothing that that Under Armour has with the, I guess, light it is. Right. I can't imagine wearing anything else right now or I'd be, you know, I'd be just roasting. So, right. Yeah. You have uh, to wear the, basically you're, you're wearing the base layer. That's that seriously, the wicking that's material. It, that's exactly. it. That's all you can really tolerate. That's what I found when I was down there. I was wearing shorts, yeah. shorts and a, in a, you know, a, some really light synthetic pullovers. And that's all I could bear with, you know, deal with it. Other than that, it was, 
it would have been it would have been like running a marathon. It was, there was I, that much sweat coming off of me at the time. I I hear you. Yep. I hear you. And those guys, you know, again, those guys are Under Armour's based in Maryland, so they they, they get hunt it. the right. same the same area that you you were down and sweating right. sweating bullets at. So I think they 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 get that. And, Makes sense um, that they're there, and that's that's kind of <laughs> they they develop wicking material and walk outside and test it instantly. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Yep. So. Very interesting. So tell me, what about boots? Do you get into a particular kind of boot? Uh, do you care about rubber or or it doesn't matter. I think it depends on what I'm I'm trying to do. There obviously the the rubber boots will hold less scent, but I, I think in general they're a little louder. So if I'm if I'm walking in with with my climber, I, I generally have like hiking boots, just trying to be as quiet as I can while I, I move through the the woods. But um, I, if I'm headed into a fixed stand, and especially you know there's some some river bottom kind of areas that i that i hunt that they're a lot soggier uh rubber boots are the obviously uh the choice there probably use hiking boots more than than anything else okay but uh but really really douse them with with the uh the no scent spray before i head in gotcha all right so it sounds like you put a lot of effort into uh scent cover up uh shower products make sure you're you don't you eliminate as much human odor as you can and then spray down on top of that and keep your clothes separate and keep it you know basically in the field before you climb the stand all right so the scent control and i can certainly understand that where you are where that becomes a, a big factor uh, and i would assume and we can get into some of this in a little bit but i would assume wind is a a factor and you try to decide which stand hunt based off of the wind conditions yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and wind is all wind is always a factor. I think when, you know, the technology that we have now with trail cameras and being able to, you know, to see where deer are are bedding and eating and moving and when they're doing that that it's more important to be able to hunt the stand the deer are currently walking by than to hunt a stand based on wind and hope they're coming by. I think taking care of that scent um, allows you to kind of the prime stands regardless of wind, right. especially bow hunting. I think rifle hunting obviously is a little to you know, reach out and touch a deer at 300 yards. I don't think you really need to worry about your scent a whole lot. That's a good point. But That's if, a good point. But if, but if you're, you know, 20 yards, 30 yards from a deer, the last thing you want to do is, you know, or even, even if you're hunting the, the right wind and the wind, the wind changes or the wind swirls, uh, which happens to everybody i mean really taking care of that that scent i think uh goes a long way right i completely completely agree so let's let's uh, turn a little bit to your personal life we interviewed sure. uh eva and and jim uh on the yep. same show a while back and i believe uh we we got talking about you a little bit and i believe you came and shut the door so you didn't have to listen in um, <laughs> at one point how did you meet eva so it's a pretty cool story we uh Eva's from Western Canada. I'm from, you know, kind of Eastern Canada. And uh, we met in Raleigh, North Carolina uh, at the Dixie Deer Classic, which is a big, uh, big show here in the Southeast. And it's based in Raleigh at the the North Carolina State Fairgrounds. And I was playing for the Hurricanes. And it's a little bit of a funny story. I, I had gone into the to the show with with one of my buddies who's a North Carolina wildlife biologist for and actually for deer and he was a big fan of Jim's show and I you know obviously I had watched Jim for a long time at that point but uh, Eva was just kind of getting into the show and and I was complaining about uh, not hearing girls with northern accents <laughs> to my to my buddy and uh, having you know the the girls with the southern accents and it was just uh, something new for me and um so we're walking around the show and just kind of looking at gear and being the kind of hunting nerds that we are and and he said yeah i think that's uh, i think that's eva shockey i think she's canadian and uh i said really so i walked up and and i i think i asked her if she was from saskatchewan because i my buddy had uh, that was the intel that i got from my friend was (laughs) Eva was from saskatchewan so i walked up and said hey are you from Saskatchewan? And she said, actually, no, I'm not. I'm from BC. My dad was originally from Saskatchewan. So gotcha. Did he feed I you said, bad intel on purpose? He did, yeah. He did, well, I don't uh, think it was on purpose. Okay. But he gave you um, some bad intel. Yeah. He did give me some bad intel. But uh, uh, I said, listen, I said, uh, you know, I, I won't take up too much of your time. I just really wanted to hear a girl that 
had a Canadian accent and, um, you know, we just chatted a little more and, and I, I left there and I, I, uh, I told the guy I was with and, and I actually texted a buddy back home. I said, you need to look this girl, Eva Shockey up. I'm going to marry her. And, uh, and then we, you know, Eva and I kept in touch for about a year. She was traveling a ton at the time. And, yeah. you know, she would send me pictures of, of hunts and where she was and what she was doing and killing. And, and I would do the same. And, and then she was coming back through the, the Southeast to, to do another show. And she stopped by and, and we, uh, we got to go out on our first date and spend some time together. And, and that's how it all started. Well, that's interesting because she actually tells us a very similar story as it turns out. And that, that you said that you would marry her. And yeah, yeah, did. that's the truth. That is the truth. <laughs> and, that's pretty uh, good. Probably goes back to, you know, like I said, I, when I was seven or eight years old, I knew I wanted to be a professional hockey player and I just put my mind to it. Well, it was the same. I decided, same yeah, thing. I'm going to marry this girl. So I just... that's funny. <laughs> now what, but, uh, what Jim says is that, or actually I think Eva said it, that, um, th- there was, there were only certain men in the entire world that were as tough as her dad and that, you were one of the few that fit the bill that being a, a hockey player, you were as tough as, as her dad. Um, and that was really the only kind of man that she could marry. Well, that's, uh, those are some big shoes to fill. Yeah. Um, Jim's, uh, you know, he's going to be, I think 59 this year. And, um, he just left Kazakhstan to go to Russia. Right. And, uh, you know, he's doing, He's doing some mountain hunts now that are, uh, you know, he would put any 30 year old to shame. Um, right. And, you know, I, I've got, I haven't got a chance to do any sheep hunts with them uh, yet. Ho- hopefully, hopefully one of these days, but even, you know, doing some of the, the bear hunting we've done together, um, you know, he's a, uh, he's a tough dude and certainly a, a cool father-in-law to have. Uh, we, uh, I certainly, certainly locked out on that and he and I get along well and uh and I, I really do look forward to getting to hunt with him some more nice do you feel like you're you're one of those tough guys do you think you've you've you fit the or fit the criteria I mean I, I don't know if it's tough to say you're a tough guy but it's a I, tough I think, question yeah yeah I think um you know I think I've gone through quite a bit in my my life as far as life experience and probably different injuries and things that uh that not many people at my age have gone through and you know obviously there's a part of hockey that's very physical and very testosterone driven and uh the willing to compete and fight and i really love that stuff and, and i uh do i think i'm you know a tough guy i wouldn't say that but when it comes down to it again i, I think i'd be i'm the type of guy that's just willing to do kind of whatever it takes and gotcha. um if you want to call that tough i guess I guess it is. But. It is, but it's it's nice to hear that you're humble about it. And I think from people looking from the outside in to the NHL world, that you have to be a tough competitor to to survive that that level of play. Um, just just the way it is. I mean, there's just no way you could be a weak individual and go in. You have to have a level of of mental and physical toughness to to get through that. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. It's. Uh... I think most hockey players would tell you the same thing where we we've just done it for so long that it's like, it's, it's almost second nature. It's uh, you know, to, I think the the competition and, and that compete level is what really drives players. And, and that's probably what I'll miss the most about, about playing, especially this year is that ability to compete on a, on a nightly basis almost is uh, it's hard to replicate in, in doing anything else, but yeah, um, you must miss the competition because I mean it's a super high level, and w- when you're used to it, like you described, uh, and it's not there anymore, you must be craving it still in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's funny. I, I've got I've got friends that, um, and I'm thinking of one guy in particular, and he's the the absolute nicest guy you've ever met in your life off the ice. <laughs> right. On the ice, he's an absolute you know just maniac, just a terror. 
he really is and he's still playing today and he's um four or five years older than me and he's still playing today and i'm pretty sure the only reason he's still playing is so he can punch people <laughs> <laughs> he can legally get away with it yeah. and uh yeah it's funny those things kind of cross your mind still now that you know i if i deal with somebody in a real estate deal now that's frustrating or uh you know I, everybody deals with people like that it's 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 part of the you know, part of life, but right. unfortunately, my my past career, I could just punch him in the mouth, or right. you know, right. there was there was there were right. certain things you could and, you could do, and and, and and hockey that that might <laughs> that might be a penalty, and you might end up maybe in the if you get caught, <laughs> if you get caught, and and maybe maybe even if you did get caught, it's just like oh well, it's just hockey. Uh, exactly, you do it out off of the the, the off of the rink. Um, that's assault and you're going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. A little different. Yeah, so it's um, absolutely amazing. So let's, let's, uh, talk about one of your most memorable deer hunts, Tim. Um, yeah. uh, did, where are we going to go? So this is an easy one for me. It's, uh, it's a, it's a wild story. Um, but it started off, I, I had just signed in Toronto with the Maple Leafs. And, uh, mm-hmm. so I was going back to my, you know, playing for the Maple Leafs in Toronto was like, a kid growing up in New York playing for the Yankees for me. I Oh yeah, definitely. I, I grew up just down the road. I mean, I was I was a Leaf fan since I was 5 years old or 4 years old since the, every road hockey game I ever played, I was a different, you know, Toronto Maple Leaf. So right. the second exhibition game in training camp, we're playing in Pittsburgh and get caught up with a big guy in Pittsburgh, Mike Rupp, and on a face-off and I fall backwards. And I literally hear a tearing, like a piece of paper tearing. Hmm. And I kind of got got up and skated over to the bench. And I knew right away what happens. And I, I got to the bench and I, I turned to my trainer and I said, I just ripped my pec. Oh. And he said, what? And I said, yeah, I, I'm telling you, I just ripped my pec. So I, we got into the, the, the locker room and sure enough, I mean, I, I tore, tore my pec up right off at the tendon and my, my pec had kind of balled up in the middle of my chest and i knew obviously that was not going to be good and um we got back to toronto and got got some mris and basically they told me i needed surgery and i was essentially done for the year um yeah so my season hadn't even started and it was over and i uh, got to I, I got to the sur- the surgeon's office and i uh, was um down at the cleveland clinic and in Ohio and the doctor was from Canada and we got talking and the first thing he asked me, he said, you know, we, we get this a lot with football players and weightlifters. And he said, we, we really don't get it much with hockey players at all. And the reason is it's, you know, sometimes it's, it has to do with steroid use. And he said, so I got to ask you if, you know, you've been taking anything. And, and I looked him square in the eye and I said, you just had my shirt off and you have the nerve to ask me if I'm taking steroids. <laughs> and he, he started, he started dying laughing. And, but my next question to him was when you think I'll be able to pull a bow, right? He kind of shook his head and he said, you're not going to be, you're not going to be pulling a bow anytime soon. So I was pretty bummed out. I, I was excited about getting to hunt at home. There was a, a farmer who I became friends with uh, his, his son and my sister went to school together and he was a hockey player. And anytime I had extra sticks or, you know, could help him out with gear, I would. And it turned out to help me in, in, the in the hunting aspect, there wasn't a lot of land around to hunt and the land that was available was, was taken up. So um, this farmer allowed me to, to hunt his property and, and I had actually prepared all summer. So I had stand set, I was ready to go and, and then I go and, and tear my pec. So I was I was bummed out, but a good friend from from Pennsylvania, who I'd become friends with when I played down there, he owned a little bow shop uh, in DuPont, Pennsylvania, called the Bow Clinic. And he said, I, I'll take care of you. And he sent me a, a crossbow. Hmm. Oh, okay. That makes so, sense. Right. So it's my you know my right pack can't really pull anything so i i'm in a i'm in a sling and i'm figuring out a way to to cock a crossbow and be able to do everything on my own so i can eventually hunt and i think i was probably getting in trouble if, if anybody from the team found out but i think i was in a tree probably two and a half weeks after my surgery <laughs> and uh 
uh, I had rigged a, I had rigged a cross a crossbow with a little monopod, and I would pull it up one handed, and I'd, I'd kind of tied the caulking aid off so I could could pull the caulking aid with one hand to caulk it. So I was I was set, and I was hunting this little swamp early morning, and and I would hear barring quite a bit, and I never never got a glimpse of them in the daylight and i had some trail camera pictures of some pretty good deer and so for me this second week in november has always been a a good week and in particular november 13th for whatever reason is a just a deer killing day for me so it it turned out to be about the 10th of november and i found a, a rub line that was was pretty new i set up on it and i moved it i moved a stand I thought I would I'd move a stand, I'd give it a couple of days and hopefully sneak in and hunt it and I don't know what I was doing that day but it was it was almost too late to go into the stand and I and I was really debating on whether I should even go in or not and I did and I sat there and I was sitting there and, and not really much was going on it was pretty quiet again this little swamp was it might have been 10 or 12 acres I could hear cars kind of driving by. It was still a very, it was in the country, but it wasn't. People would use this one country back road to drive back and forth to work a lot. So I could hear cars kind of going by. It it wasn't your typical, you know, beautiful uh, in the middle of the woods hunt, but there was a a soybean field. and, And that's basically where I grew up was all corn and soybean. And there was a soybean field off the back of the swamp and 10 acres. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, just, kind of relaxing and I pull up my grunt call and I make two grunts and this giant stands up and he's about 100 maybe 120 yards away I mean tongue out mad and just storms straight to me I mean really it, it seemed like he was I mean he was on a mission but he got it, it seemed like it was like 15 minutes by the from the time he stood up to the time he got to me but it was probably maybe three minutes <laughs> <laughs> and uh he came in to i bet you 10 yards hmm. and looked straight up at me all the while i've got a monopod between my feet holding <laughs> holding this <laughs> this crossbow up you know i got my my hand on the on the my finger on the trigger my left hand on the trigger the butt stock of the crossbow on my left shoulder which is the wrong side for me but i'm looking through my right eye so if you can imagine how you know, he's probably looking at me thinking, what the, you know, what the heck is this guy doing? Right. Shooting wrong handed, but with my, with my right eye, he was quartered a little bit towards me and, and basically staring at me. And I thought, you know, he was about to bolt. And, and I just said, you know, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take this shot. And I was pretty confident that I could make it. And, and I did. And after I let the, the arrow go, he just turned and started to walk away. And I, I really hadn't hunted with a crossbow that at all so right. you know i knew i was on I, I i had sighted it in and everything but i said did i just miss that deer i mean he he walked away so nonchalantly and he walked maybe maybe 15 yards yeah. and just fell over dead no and, way and uh he was about 150 155 inch deer which is still at yeah, my parents house just an just a that's interesting so he just just didn't even know he got hit and walked away and yeah it it was bizarre it really was and um you probably know that the crossbow bolts are so short that it it went right in them it didn't it didn't pass through it kind of went in and and hit hit the back shoulder on the other side and um and stayed in them but so i didn't i didn't even know where it went and then i had to call my dad and some friends because i could <laughs> i couldn't even drag it out by myself i you know i'm one-armed i've got <laughs> right i had a lot of help with uh <laughs> with taking the deer out right. of the you guys are gonna have to and... come help me i'm i'm injured yeah. uh, i'm yeah, not exactly. supposed to be here but uh <laughs> don't tell anybody but i just shot a monster <laughs> right hey, that's that is literally the conversation yeah, and one of my buddies was out hunting with me and he's kind of across the road and i and i texted him yeah you know, and i mean full on shakes like i was i was shaking because i knew uh you know i knew that i i just killed a you know the biggest deer that i've that i've shot right um so he was fired up and i uh, came kind of running over and we uh we got the deer out and being right-handed and having your right hand in a sling it needed needed some help with field dressing and but that uh that was one of the the coolest everything just came together and to have a 
you know, to have a, a big mature deer like that come in on a grunt call uh, and it was just, uh, it was a really cool experience. And that's um, awesome. <laughs> that's really yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it kind of made up for my, my crummy year as far as injuries go. So that was uh, certainly a highlight that year. Right. Uh, that's a great highlight. Very, very nice. Well, that's a great story, Tim. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah. My pleasure. Well, let's turn to the 10 rapid fire questions. And uh, All right. I didn't prep you for these. I, I like to keep it that way. Just a little, uh, you know, like to get you thinking off the cuff. All right. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Use scent control. Okay. We all have these little things, a device or a good luck charm or what, whatever it might be, and it drives us crazy if we don't have it with us in our pack. So if we leave it at the house, we just think about it all day. What's that one thing for you? The little wind checker bottle. Okay. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? Oh, man. <laughs> I got a lot of these. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I think that my biggest pet peeve is when someone is driving in the passing lane going slower than they should be. Oh, that's interesting. That's probably a metaphor for, for life too, right? Uh, oh, that drives me insane. So you're 32 now, is that correct? Yes, Okay. correct. So you're 32. What would you tell the 20-year-old Tim Brent, knowing what you know today about life? Just to you know continue to, to work hard and, um, and believe in yourself and, and the good, good things will happen. Gotcha. All right, you're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world, and a stranger comes up to you in the lobby, and you strike up a conversation, and they ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? I tell them I'm in commercial real estate. I'm a commercial real estate broker. Um, I was fortunate enough to play hockey for professional hockey for 12 years, um, but but uh, a, new, a new commercial real estate broker, and see if I can see if I can help them find a you know, a nice piece of land here in North Carolina. <laughs> gotcha. Very nice. And you hand them your business card. That's right. right. Uh, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I had a bulletproof coffee and two hard boiled eggs. No kidding. I, I'm into bulletproof coffee too. That's really cool. So good. Yeah. It's fantastic stuff. My wife thought I was weird when I first introduced it, but she's like, man, this is kind of good. All right. You get your own billboard. It's a blank canvas. You can put anything you want on it. What would it say? I mean, it's, kind of cliche but uh, treat people the way you want to be treated right uh, that's, that's an old oldie but goodie for sure yeah yep. if i say the word successful to you who's the first person that pops into your head and why my wife eva mm-hmm. and uh i'm just super proud of what she's done for for the hunting community and in particular women in the outdoors and how how great of a role model she is for especially young women and there's a unfortunately a lot of a lot of not so great role models that that get a lot of airtime now, and you know, with a a daughter on the way myself, I I kind of cringe at uh, at what these young young women have to uh, to look at. So I know the person that Eva is and what she's done and what she does every day, and I, I hope that there's there's more women like her that my daughter will be able to look up for right. or look up to. That's a very very good response. Okay. What's a typical day in the life of Tim Brent look like? A typical day, I'm up. I'm up at about five thirty. I do. I get my workout in at six. I'm done at seven. I come home, shower, bulletproof coffee, two hard boiled eggs, get ready for work, head into the office, and uh, usually in the mornings it's it's mostly emails and you know getting back to people, and then as the day goes on. A lot of the time it's in your truck and you're, you know, driving around looking at real estate. And recently it's been knocking on people's doors and asking if they have any interest in selling property. You know, this past week sitting on a front porch with an older gentleman drinking sweet tea and (laughs) talking about opportunities. And then a lot of the time, Eva and I will, will meet after work at our hunting property and we'll hunt together and and then come home and, and cook dinner and, and do it all over again. Nice. That's fantastic, man. All right. So oh, it sounds like you incorporate deer hunting into your daily life during deer season in a lot of ways. And so my final question is what's a typical deer hunting day in the life look like, but it sounds like it's part of your regular day. Yeah. I, I, I literally, I really do try and, and, and get in the woods as much as I can during, during this time of the year. And again, I, I just really think it's, it's so important to, to be able to disconnect from, from just everything, you know, the, the emails and the, 
the phone ringing off the hook. And those are all things that all of us have to deal with. And it's, right. you know, I, I enjoy working and I enjoy that part of my day, but I also enjoy being able to get away and, and enjoy God's video game and nature. So that's, that's fantastic. No, I completely agree with that statement. Tim, this has been fantastic. And I, I got to say, thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure speaking with you for the last hour. Uh, it, I, it's great learning about you and your life and where you're from and where you, where you want to go. And where, where could we learn more about you or how can we connect with you online? If you have an online presence, um, if people listening to this wanted to see more about your life. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess you can you could follow me on on Instagram renter thirty seven um, and to be honest you can probably follow everything I'm doing Eva usually rats me out on anything that I <laughs> I, I got my stuck my truck stuck the other night while we were hunting and I think before I got home I had about ten messages from buddies saying oh you got your your truck stuck uh, you know giving me a hard time because right. Eva posted it on Instagram already. So gotcha. you can probably find, you know, most of most things about me through Eva, but uh, you, you can also follow me on there. So it's good that she hasn't found the Facebook live the feed as much as she <laughs> hasn't taken a liking to it, I guess. Right. Yeah. I've, uh, I've actually been waiting to, to see that. Uh, right. I'm not even going to say that out loud because she's standing here, but <laughs> yeah, don't plant <laughs> any, that, don't plant any right. seeds. That's, that, that's that could right. go badly for you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Tim. This is this is great. Thank you so much for joining us on the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, and hopefully we can uh, have you back on and tell some more deer stories down the road. I hope I have some deer stories to tell you, so I appreciate it, Jay. Thanks for having me. Uh, that was pretty cool listening to Tim tell us his story of his NHL career and how he met up with Eva Shockey at a deer hunting expo. How's that for fun, your future wife? Yeah, it's crazy, ain't it? And of course... His buddy gave him false information. <laughs> I guess it worked. <laughs> yeah, it worked. It worked anyway. So, Yeah, fascinating story. Uh, good luck to Tim Brent and his new career as a commercial real estate agent. And Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week? Yeah, we do, Jay. And uh... The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, used firearms, bows, used bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsessportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Something that uh, actually popped in my mind this evening as I was walking into a, a new unknown piece of property. And, uh, you know, I, I was I pulled in, parked my truck, and, and I literally made probably 25 steps in the woods. And next thing you know, I was blowing deer out. No kidding. And I said, oh, man. This 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 is good and bad. Real good that the deer are bedding there. Real bad for me wanting to hunt right in that spot. Right, right. So you know, it, it, it comes down to when I when I went in there and blew them deer out that quick that I know that I need to to capitalize on that spot, but be extremely careful getting in and out of there. Um, mm. and, and literally, I'm I'm 50 yards in the woods. I set up a ground blind and I'm gonna hunt right adjacent to where I know they're bedding at. But I took a leaf blower with me, and I blew the leaves off the ground so that when I walk in and out of there, I'm quiet. I think there's an, there's enough cover between me and and where they're bedding at to comfortably slide in there with the with, with the leaf blower blowing the leaves out. I got a quiet trail to walk on to bare dirt. It's it's absolutely ironic that you say that, and here's why. I picked up a new leaf blower this year. I had one that was just a basic handheld unit and I could never figure out why the leaves wouldn't pile up when I was actually blowing leaves around the way they I see everybody else it seemed like they'd zip through the yard no problem well I think it's because I didn't have the power that I needed so I decided to go out and get one of those backpack blowers and picks uh, blows leaves around like nobody's business so I got to thinking like you know what I'm going to it's awful crunchy on the way to my tree stand right now really right. crunchy I'm taking this leaf blower out tomorrow at noon and I'm going to blow all the way through to my tree stand just so I can get in and out of there quietly because, man, no wonder the deer aren't coming in. They can hear me from a mile around. It's amazing. Yep. Absolutely great, great idea. Yeah, so take your leaf blower out there and, and blow your walking trail out and clean it up so that you're quiet leaving and coming and going. That's crazy that I did that or will be doing that tomorrow, and I had the exact thought today. We are on the same page, my friend. Perfect. So – 
awesome show. Thank you to Tim Brent for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast. Thank you to Scentlock Enforcer for sponsoring the show. Thank you to the Eurohanger for sponsoring the show as well. And thank you to Morse's Sporting Goods, which I was at Morse's Sporting Goods this week, buying a few extra items. So thank you to Morse's Sporting Goods for sponsoring the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. Dusty, it's been a fantastic show. Love listening to Tim Brent. And um, unfortunately, it's time for us to go. But we'll be back next week. Yeah, it is unfortunate, you know. And, and from from our hearts, thank you for tuning in with us mm-hmm. every week, week after week. Before we cut out, how can we reach out to you, Dusty, when you, we're not here in the studios? Shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors, and get a little bit of my personal life at Chasing Antler on Instagram. Jay, where can the people reach out to you and you're not on the mic? You can shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com. And if uh, you'd like to check out our Facebook contingent, the almost 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Facebook. If you would like to post your buck to that same Facebook page, there is a process. And we don't post them all. We do have some criteria. Mostly it should be a, a buck, uh, a fairly good buck. We will post smaller bucks if they're your first buck. But we, we, we require that you send in a picture of you and the buck, not just a picture of the buck, not just a picture of you, but you and the buck together in the same photo. And we, we require that you give us the state of kill, the year of kill, and the hunter's first name. So if you can get that done, you have a pretty darn good shot of getting your buck featured on the Big Buck Registry Facebook page. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Google+. Plus. And it's always the same thing, bigbuckregistry.com slash wherever you want to go. So bigbuckregistry.com Facebook, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Twitter, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Instagram, and so on and so on. So whatever social media platform you play on, just go bigbuckregistry.com forward slash whatever that is. If you would like to become a patron, we are looking for more pledges. We've had several in the last week. But we can always use more. And all you have to do to pledge your support to this show and help us make this show better is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. And our patron account is there. And you can sign up for whatever you want to do, whether it's $1, $5, $10 per month. And it's not forever. You can cut it off whenever you feel like you've maxed out. But we can always use your support. There's always more equipment to buy. There's always more places to go to get more interesting content, which means sometimes we have to travel. So whatever you can do, whatever you can pony up, if you enjoy the show, please, 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 bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Other than that, um, we're, you, can, you might want to check us out on YouTube if you're a YouTuber, where our entire catalog is being rebroadcast over there. We're almost done. But rest assured, every single week now, Our newest show will always be on YouTube, but you can find us on Stitcher, YouTube. You can find us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Blueberry, and any other place that most podcasts are found. That's where you'll find us. Dusty, I think that's a wrap. It's everywhere where we are at. That's that's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. A whole lot of big buck. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. Thank you.